Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being here with us this afternoon. Uh, I'd also like to thank Mundadori Education for helping us uh, organize this event. Uh, as everybody knows, uh, we've got uh, David Spencer with us this afternoon, and he will be uh, discussing some of the, the new materials uh, for 2021. Um, I'd just like to make two uh, quick remarks before I pass the mic over to Dave. Uh, first, um, he will try to follow some of the questions as he's doing the presentation, but I will also be uh, monitoring questions. So uh, in the final five minutes, um, I'll be able to um, address any of the questions that he hasn't seen. And secondly, um, from tomorrow, you will be able to find the attestato uh, uh, for this webinar at mandatoryeducation.it slash attestati. So without further ado, I'd like to um, pass the mic over to my friend, Dave, and uh, let's see what he has to say. Thank you, Dave. Hello, everybody. Can you uh, can you hear me? If you just want to put in the t in the chat box, if you can hear me and see me correctly. Hopefully, you're all there. Okay, it's looking good. Um, right, I mean, uh, it's great to be here with you. Um, this is, uh, of course, a special uh, presentation just for Italy one of my favorite countries. Um, I hope you're all doing well in these difficult times. Uh, of course, I'm here in Spain, so I'm English, but I live in Spain just outside Madrid. And uh, in fact, exactly one year ago, I was about to visit your wonderful country when, of course, uh, we all know what happened. Um, so it's a shame that I never got the chance to visit you all to give my talks but at least I'm here with you today, okay? And we're gonna be talking about critical reading and critical thinking. Um, as Cassie May mentioned, I will try to look at the chat box, but for various reasons, it might be difficult. If you have something that you particularly would like to say to me or to ask me, then at the end of this session, we should have 10 minutes for questions, I hope, or maybe more, who knows? Uh, today, we're looking at the question of critical thinking and critical reading. Um, and I think this is like a very interesting topic in the 21st century for many reasons, which I will explain. Um, I wanted to begin my session with some really exciting news. And maybe you have seen this news uh, or you've heard something about it. Here is my breaking news, OK? Have scientists really found a gigantic crystal pyramid under the Bermuda Triangle? What do you think, actually? Can you put in the chat box? Do you think yes or no? Is this real or is this not real? What do you reckon? So crystal pyramids under the ocean, what do we reckon? Do they exist or do they not exist? Well, I'm going to give you um, some more information about these amazing crystal pyramids. I even have uh, some photographs. OK, so here they are. Here are the crystal pyramids under the ocean. And in fact, um, this article here, which is based on a real article, it's in Gateway Second Edition, but it's based on a real article. It says that these pyramids are, in fact, bigger than the Pyramid of Cheops in Egypt. OK. And uh, it says that um, that they were probably built on land, but they've ended up in the uh, ocean because of an earthquake. OK, now, I don't know. I don't know if you're believing this story or not. The reason that I um, got interested in critical reading and critical thinking is because of my daughter. Uh, my daughter is now at university studying biochemistry. She's always been a very good student and a very intelligent student. But one day she was the one who came to me to tell me about this amazing story about glass pyramids under the sea. And I couldn't quite believe that she believed this story because she was convinced that this story is absolutely true. And um, it suddenly made me think that because of the internet, because we see so many strange things on the internet, we probably end up believing almost everything. And I sort of suddenly, it made me realize, how do we make sure 
how do we help people, particularly young people, to decide what is really real and what is, if you like, fake news? And um, this really sort of got me interested in the whole topic of critical reading and critical thinking. Um, now, when you find a story like this on the internet, how do you know, because I was faced with the question, how do I convince my daughter that it's not actually true? And here are some questions. If you look at 5A, here are some ways that you can help your students, your teenage students, to decide, is this text real or is it fake? If you look at number one, it says, who are the people mentioned in the text? Do they really exist? Um, so, of course, if it's a text about somebody that we all know, we know that that person exists. But in this text, I'll just show you again, it talks about Dr. Verlag Meyer. So, one thing that our students can do is check, does this person exist? Does he appear anywhere else in any other stories? Number two, sometimes in a text like this about the Crystal Pyramids, it talks about scientists, it talks about experts, it talks about people, people say, but does it actually explain who those scientists are, who the experts are, who the people are? Are they from a university? Are they from a government agency? Are they from a hospital? If we look back again at my text, it talks about experts, it talks about scientists, it says American and French scientists, but who are these people? It never really explains, it never says which university they are representing, for example. Question number three, who wrote the text? I mean, who is the author, does it say? What do you know about this person? What other things have they written? So um, on the internet, we see many, many articles written by people, but sometimes there is no name, there is no identification, there is no history to this person. Question number four, which website is the text from? So is the website a famous website? Is it a well-known website? Is it, again, something like a university website? What is the website? Um, and of course, in news like this about the Crystal Pyramids, there's not lots of news, paranormal news maybe, but is, that's not really news, is it? Number five, do the places in the text really exist? Well, in this text, they talk about Florida, but they also talk about, for example, the Bermuda Triangle. Now, the Bermuda Triangle might exist or it might not exist. That's under discussion. It also talks about Atlantis. Does Atlantis exist? Well, again, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, in other words, let's check the names of these places. Is it Are they real places or are they fictional places? Number six, sometimes we get scientific language in a text, but sometimes we get pseudoscientific language. Um, and again, in this text here, it suddenly talks about things like pulsating crystal lights, energy fields, quantum vacuums. But do they really exist? And if so, are those expressions used correctly in our text? Number seven, is there photographic evidence of what the text says? Does it look real? So I showed you this photograph of my crystal pyramids. I don't know, what do you think? Does that look real? It doesn't look very real to me. It looks like a very blurry, difficult to see picture of maybe the Egyptian pyramids colored green or blue. And um, finally, what is the source of the article? Is it a text that comes from another place? Uh, is it from a scientific document? Is it from a newspaper? Is it from a serious magazine that you've heard of before? Now, like I said, my daughter was very happy to believe this story. Um, and it suddenly made me think, how do I prove that it's not real? And, you know, when we talk about fake news with um, the ex-president of the United States, I think you'd agree that in the 21st century, it becomes difficult to know what is real and what is fake. So this list of questions here, I think, is very useful to help our students to detect what is fake from, from what is real. So that's what we're really talking about today. And in fact, in this Metro newspaper article, because what often happens is the same story is repeated in other newspapers. Some of them are more serious, some of them are less serious. So I investigated what it says about the author, Rob War, and it says, former TV scientist, 
turned nightmare angel of the expressways. And I think that's basically telling us that this story is not very true because basically this person is looking for exciting, interesting, strange, unbelievable stories about science. So this was my starting place for thinking about critical thinking. And of course, what's really useful for us to do is to decide, first of all, what exactly is critical thinking? One of the interesting things about critical thinking is that it is very fashionable today, but of course it has been around for a long time. You may have heard of John Dewey, who is a very influential educational reformer um, and psychologist. And this is uh, over a hundred years ago. And he explained critical thinking by saying, if the suggestion that occurs is at once accepted, we have uncritical thinking, the minimum of reflection. In other words, if we simply see every story and accept it immediately, we are being very, very uncritical. So he describes critical thinking as turning the thing over in the mind, reflecting, hunting for additional evidence for new data to see whether um, this checks out, whether the story checks out or whether it becomes absurd and irrelevant. In other words, that's what we did with our crystal pyramid story. We looked for additional evidence. We were detectives, if you like. We tried to discover if this um, information has anything serious to back it up. And although this was over 100 years ago that John Dewey talked about it, I do believe that this whole question of critical thinking is more important today probably than it was 110 years ago. Why is it important? Well, I think first of all, because critical thinking is one of the main things that can help our teenage students to become autonomous, to become independent, because they can think for themselves. Um, and I think that whole idea of thinking for yourself, I think that's what we as teachers of teenagers today in 2021 have to do. Because I think there is a difference between a traditional form of education and what we might call a progressive form of education. Now, a traditional view of education would be that our students go to school simply to memorize things. We tell them things and the students simply have to believe them and learn them. So we might teach the students the dates of um, the wars and places where they happened, but we don't get them to think about why they happened, who caused it, how it, how it, what was the whole procedure. Traditional education is generally a question of memorizing facts, retaining knowledge, treating the students as if they are an empty jar. Um, now, this is a very traditional view of education. The student comes to us as a blank page. They know nothing, and we as teachers, we fill them with knowledge. Um, and what happens is the students remember basic superficial information. Um, for example, I mean, I teach in Spain. I mean, literature, um, I don't know about in Italy, but in Spain, often literature is a question of learning the dates that a book was written, the number of books that a famous novelist wrote, um, but it's only remaining on the surface. I, for me, that's not really teaching literature, it's teaching superficial literature. And I think we can contrast this traditional view with a more progressive view um, where we can have students and teachers questioning. So not just accepting knowledge, but questioning, okay? So why did it happen? When did it happen? What was the reason for this to be, um, to occur? We also, I think today, like our education, we like our students to be hands-on, to be doing things with this information, not simply memorizing it, but doing things. And in that sense, the student is an active participant in the process of learning. And in my English lessons, that's what I want to happen. I want my students to be involved. I want my students to be doing things. And I think you would agree with me, I hope, that if you want your students to learn English, you've got them, you've got to get them to be active and doing things. 
And I also believe that if we want to teach our students to think, we have to get them actively thinking. And hopefully all of this will lead to deeper learning. So instead of, for example, just reading and learning um, data about famous novelists, we're going to get them to read a text, to respond to a text, to question the text, to think about it inside out. And as Sandra Parks put it in this quotation, which I think is really nice, if you teach children what to think, you limit them to your ideas or other people's ideas. On the other hand, if you teach children how to think, then their ideas are limitless. And I think that's why critical thinking is so important today. Now, um, another reason why critical thinking is important is what we've just talked about now, fake news, okay? So if you look on the internet, we have access to all sorts of stories, all sorts of reports, all sorts of documents, but the question is, are they real or not? And the problem with fake news is it gets in our way of learning real news. So it becomes a barrier, it sends us in the wrong direction. And as we've seen from my crystal pyramids uh, example, what we want to be doing with our students is getting them to get to the real situation, not to be confused by all of the fake news. Similarly, if we're talking about the internet age, we also need students to think critically so that they can stay safe online. And um, this is an example from Gateway to Success, the new course uh, that's just coming out then or that came out recently uh, from Mondadori Macmillan. In this citizenship task, then we're getting students to question the whole idea about how they act on social media. And we get them to think critically about followers and friends. So is a follower on internet, are they really a friend? Um, is sharing um, with a person, a real person, the same as sharing online? Um, what happens when you like or tag a post? So getting students to think critically, this is sending them to an Italian uh, website that you can see there, Generazioni Conese, I think it is. Pardon my uh, Spanish, English, Italian pronunciation. But getting students to question then uh, everything that happens online, because it's really important. We think that teenage students are experts in um, uh, internet matters, but they're not always, and we need to help them and protect them. I also think critical thinking is important because thinking in general is becoming part of evaluation. I'm sure that you all know PISA, right? The program for, not the city, okay? Not the beautiful city in Italy. PISA, the program for international student assessment. And I don't know if you know this, this was going to happen in 2021, but it has been delayed because of the pandemic. But PISA are not just having maths, reading and science tests. They are also going to introduce a creative thinking test. And this is really representative, I think, of the need that everybody is feeling for getting our students to think cre creatively and critically. Also, I think thinking is part of evaluation in English exams. Now, I'm not sure, I never can remember if this is an Italian exam or maybe it's an exam from Switzerland. Um, you can tell me later if you think it seems familiar to you. This is an English composition for learners of English. And you can see that, for example, um, essay number three, they have to write 350 to 500 words. Hope, what meaning can hope have in our lives? Uh, or for example, number five, beauty is being in harmony with what you are. Now, I find this fascinating because in my view, this is not just testing English language. This is not just testing a student's control of grammar or vocabulary. I think this is also testing students' powers of thinking. If you want to answer, for example, number three or number five well, it's also about your ideas. So we need to encourage students to think so that they can come up with ideas. Um, and if you've taught Cambridge Advanced, you will know that um, for a teenager to pass Cambridge Advanced, we need to teach them lots of English, but we also need them to, to teach them ideas so that they can actually answer the questions. 
I teach in Spain near Madrid. If you can just about read number five there, this is the essay that my students had to write some years ago. What should local authorities do to improve transport and mobility in large cities? And my students, when they had to answer this question, they were all really, really angry. They were angry because they said, well, how do I know? How do I know what we should do to improve transport? Um, the local authorities themselves don't know how to improve transport. So how can I do it? Uh, and unfortunately, or I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not sure. In the evaluation criteria, this is in Spanish. I'll show you the English translation in a second. What is fascinating is that the official uh, criteria for evaluation, they actually give one out of the total of three marks for a message which is clear, precise, coherent with interesting ideas. And the students have to develop a personal point of view with original opinions which are adequately backed up. In other words, in my opinion, one out of three marks is given to the students for thinking, okay? So it's not just a question of English. This is not, as I say, about grammar and vocabulary. This is about thinking and having ideas and having things to say. In other words, thinking is an essential skill because we need to get students to be able to answer questions. And um, fifthly and lastly, um, I think the critical thinking is important because I mentioned the quotation from John Dewey. He says that we need to hunt for additional evidence for new data and new information. And the good thing about that is I think that we can get our students to do this in English. So it's a good reason to get students to read more, to listen to more, to hunt out more information in English so that they can actually um, think more critically. In other words, skills practice is a way that we can improve critical thinking. And that's why I think critical thinking and critical reading go together. Now, um, I, I'm not going to go through this uh, in detail, but um, before we get on to critical reading, I do want to just mention that the question why is such an amazing tool for, for teachers to get our students thinking. And personally, I think I asked the question why many, many times in any lesson. So um, why do you think that this alternative is correct? Students have to choose the correct alternative. But I don't always care if they just get the right answer. I want to know if they understand why it's the correct answer. Um, we can use the question why to prove that students have understood grammar, that they've understood a text, that they can justify their opinions when they're speaking, that they can um, understand even the last question there. Why are we doing this? So that's one of my favorite questions. After an activity, after the end of a lesson, why did we do what we did today? These are all just ways of getting our students to think critically about what they're doing in the English classroom. Now, um, because one why is never enough, this is one of my favorite new activities to do in class. Uh, I don't do this all the time, but it is a useful tool. I mentioned before my students were not happy doing their um, essay about solving the problems of traffic in big cities. And it so happened that I discovered this thinking routine by Sakichi Toyoda, who was the creator of Toyota Cars. What you do is you ask the question why, and then the answer, you respond with another question why. And the idea is that you ask that question five times to get to the root of a question. And I think this is just such a powerful um, tool. So why is the traffic so bad in big cities? Because there are so many people driving cars nowadays. So the next question would be, okay, well, why are there so many people driving cars? And you might answer, for example, well, because public transport isn't very good. So then the next question would be, well, why isn't public transport very good? And you might say, because it's not safe. And then the next question is obviously, why is it not safe? So it's a very easy routine for students to think of. Um, it's a very easy routine for students to follow. And I think that we can really get to the root. Uh, we can generate lots of thinking by just doing this um, interesting little activity 
the five whys. Now, if we're talking about critical reading skills, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, identify different skills that we can encourage in our students. I'm going to show you examples from, for example, Gateway to Success. But just remember, of course, that these reading, critical reading skills, we can use with any text at any moment. OK, so whatever text you're using, get your students to do this. The first one is the one that we've already talked about identifying true facts from bogus facts. So that was when we looked at this idea of identifying, are the people real? Are the places real? Is the text from a real website? Is it a serious website? Who is doing the research? So we've already talked about this, okay? I've already mentioned this particular reading skill. Another really useful and maybe the most basic uh, critical reading skill of all is the idea of identifying facts versus opinions. And you can do this again with any text. Um, of course, sometimes it might be a question of does it include more facts or more opinions? You can even do this with simply taking one important sentence from a text and saying, OK, students, is this sentence describing a fact or is it expressing an opinion? And obviously, that is a really important skill for our students to know. Uh, we're going to read a text about the uh, White House. And I thought I'd just ask a few questions before we begin. Um, can you guess in the chat box, how many bathrooms do you think the uh, White House has? Any idea? How many, how many um, bathrooms in the White House? Just put your ideas in the chat box if you can. Taking a long time, anybody? No, I can't see anybody. Maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm looking in the wrong place, but I can't see any comments. Okay, well, in fact, uh, the, the answer is, how many bathrooms does the White House have? Is in fact 35, okay? What's special about the desk in the Oval Office? Does anybody have, it, have any ideas? Uh, you might think it's a high-tech desk, but in fact, it's exactly the opposite, okay? Um, we're going to see in the text in a second, and I'll show you the text so that you can find out the answer. But uh, just have a think why you think it's special. Uh, what sport do some people play in the, the Oval Office? So any ideas there? What do you reckon? So what sport would um, an American president play in the Oval Office? And the fourth question, there are four doors in the Oval Office. One takes you to a private dining room, so a study. Two take you to the West Wing. And where does the fourth one take you? So I'm not sure if anybody's got any ideas for that of where the fourth one goes. Somebody said golf, by the way. Okay. Yeah, that's excellent. Golf is the, it's, yeah, it was more than 10, Isabella is correct. But the, uh, yeah, the uh, sport is, in fact, uh, golf. And the last one, I'm going to show you the answer now in the text. Um, this is a text from Gateway to Success, um, and it explains that the, the desk in the Oval Office comes from a, a very old British ship from 1850, and it was Queen Victoria who gave it to a present as a present to the President of the United States. So in fact, the desk comes from a British present. And the fourth door takes you to a rose garden. Now, basically, the students read this text um, about the White Office, and then we simply get them to think afterwards, okay? So does this text generally express facts or opinions? And um, this is at a low level, so students can do this with very low level texts. But it's very useful to get them just thinking about what is uh, fact and what is opinion. Now, um, connected to that is the whole question about getting students to think about text types and about um, different sources. Now, again, this is particularly important because of the internet, okay? This is a forum um, where students have to discuss a school, and they have to discuss what they think about the Brit School, which is a famous school in Britain where many artists like Adele um, studied. Now, what happens after they read this forum text is that they, we ask the students, um, 
that, okay, this is from a forum. What are the advantages and disadvantages of uh, reading opinions in a forum? And again, our students are doing this all the time, but I really do think that many teenage students confuse um, what is a forum and what is an informative text. A forum is advantageous because everybody can give their opinion, but it's not always true, okay? So that's obviously a disadvantage. Anybody can write anything. It's a bit like TripAdvisor. I imagine that in uh, Italy, yeah, many people use TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor can be great because you get real opinions, but of course, not all opinions are maybe fair, maybe some are biased, and it's good for us just to think about that, even as adults, okay? So this information on the internet, not, not all information is the same. So is it from a reliable, objective source, or is it members of the public? Both have their advantages and disadvantages. But it's important to get our students just to begin thinking about the questions of what type of text is it, and how does that affect its credibility? Another thing that we can do for critical reading is encourage responsible research. In other words, when students read a text, we might want them then to find out more about the same topic by looking carefully on the internet. And um, as we've already mentioned a little bit from our crystal pyramids, so you look for information on the internet, but how do you know if the website is reliable? Um, who is the author of the website? So do they have a particular bias? And um, the idea of bias is a useful idea to teach our teenage students also. And I always explain bias by talking about football, right? So for example, if somebody is a big fan of uh, Real Madrid, then they will probably not report on a match between Real Madrid and Barcelona as a somebody who is a fan of Barcelona. So we can explain it in very clear, simple ways that teenagers can relate to. But of course, we can relate bias to any type of text. And if it's about politics, if it's about science, um, what is the bias of the person who is writing the text? So they're complicated issues, but we're getting our students to begin thinking about them. Also, for example, um, when you find a piece of information that you want to use in a project, for example, search for at least one other source that confirms that information. Um, you might be interested to know that when I write a book, um, every time I say something, I have to make sure that I give three, at least three different sources that confirm that information. So any of the stories that you read um, in Gateway, Gateway to Success, they will have been checked with at least three sources of information. Because again, it's very easy to state something and not have anything to back it up. Another thing that I think is really useful, really important, is the idea of critically reading by considering social, cultural differences in an objective, open-minded, and respectful way. Now, um, in Gateway to Success, uh, what I like as well in, in my books is that we um, do two or three things at the same time. What we've got here is a text about secondary schools in England, and at the same time, we're doing also some in Valsi training. But when we do this cultural exchange, um, I think it's really important always this idea of getting students to see differences maybe, for example, between schools in England and Italy, but simply also thinking about why those differences might exist. And it's very careful not to say that one is better than the other. It's simply noticing the differences and considering the differences. Uh, I must admit today, one hour before I started this session, I've just read, um, I can show you, I, I just saw this, this quotation, which I think is great because it's exactly what I'm saying here. Uh, this is from an Afro-American writer um, from last century, Audrey Lord. She says, it is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, 
and respect those differences. And I really believe that's true. Differences are a great thing. Differences don't divide us. They make life more interesting. The important thing is not having differences. The important thing is to be able to recognize, accept, and respect those differences. So when we compare with other countries, I think that's something that's really important and useful and nice to do. Here's another example from Gateway to Success where it's talking about stress in general. And there's a nice question here. Do you think a stressful life is the same all over the world? Discuss the topic with your classmates. Now, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? So um, do you think that the stress that an Italian um, teenager uh, suffers is the same as a Spanish teenager, as an American teenager? as a teenager maybe in, I don't know, Nigeria? Are they the same uh, and why and why not? So again, we're not getting, we're not looking at differences to think that they're strange. We're getting differences to try and empathize, to try and think about different ways of looking at the world, looking at life, and in this case, looking at stress. Um, by the way, and this is just a simple recommendation on a personal level, um, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but this is a great video for you to watch and uh, to watch with your teenage students. Uh, it's called School Swap, and it's School Swap Career Style. I don't know if anybody's seen this. This is a brilliant video, okay? Because it's basically, um, I think, three or four teenagers from Wales in the UK and they go to Korea to study in Korea. And I don't know if you know, but in Korea, um, I mean, I think school starts at about seven o'clock in the morning. They have extracurricular classes till about, I don't know, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the evening. And you can see from the photograph there that this poor girl from Wales is um, half dead after studying for a week in Korea. It brings up lots and lots of questions about different cultural differences, how we study. And I also think that the more you study about people in different cultures, it makes you think more about yourself and your own country and identity. So that's a, a little recommendation if you want to see a really nice video there. Another skill for critical reading is the skill of identifying and summarizing key points. And um, I think summarizing is a skill that we don't do as much as maybe when I was a child, but it's actually a very useful skill, isn't it? Because if you can summarize a text well, it means that you have really got to the center, to the heart of the text. So I think it's quite a nice activity to do um, to check comprehension and to check that students have really understood the message of the text. Um, in the chat box, could you just answer this question for me? I'm very interested to know what your answers are. How happy do you think teenagers are in Italy? Um, let's say that five is the top and one is the bottom. What do you think? How happy are teenagers in Italy, would you reckon, from one to five? Three, two, three. Of course, at the moment, we're suffering from particular problems that I would imagine bring happiness down in every country. You may know that um, there are often league tables done, which are a little, a little bit debatable, okay? But these league tables get the idea of how happy teenagers are in different countries around the world. And this is a text um, from the build up to B1 level. Um, I don't know if you know, but uh, a few years ago, uh, the Netherlands, um, the teenagers in the Netherlands were the happiest. And what we've got here is another type of forum where four different uh, students react to this information that Netherlands is the happiest country uh, for teenagers. And what we get our students to do is simply to summarize each person's opinion in one or two sentences. And again, you'll notice the question, are the students giving facts or opinions? Really useful, important question, um, I think. Um, and of course, we can get our students to compare. And it will be interesting. Did the students um, decide on the core information in each person's comments? And as I said before, I do think that summarizing is maybe one of those skills that um, maybe will come back in the future. University students often have to summarize texts. 
Um, we assume that students know how to do it, but I think it's a really important skill um, to check that students have really understood the message. Now, I think that um, if we're talking about reading and critical thinking, what we really need our students to do is to go deeper. So um, in all of my books, when we've done a reading exercise, we generally uh, get the students to respond with what they think about what they've read and also answer that critical thinking question. And this is an interesting um, text uh, that you might have heard of before. Uh, you know that many people call the 911 um, number uh, the emergency number, but sometimes um, it's for really strange things. So this text is explaining that one woman rang so that she could um, complain that a fast food restaurant didn't have her favorite dish. Um, one person rang 911 simply because they were bored and had nothing to do. Um, one person rang 911 because um, they lost their car keys. Now, um, what is happening on the surface level, of course, is that I think that this is a, it's a funny text uh, on first impressions because like these people are doing crazy things. But of course, what I want students to do is to go deeper and to realize that of course, this is not just a, um, a funny story. It's actually a really serious story because what's happening is that people are stopping um, help for real genuine incidents, for real genuine accidents or crimes. And of course, these silly people who are doing these silly calls, it looks funny, but it's not funny. So in other words, we're looking at the surface level of saying, yes, okay, uh, these things happen. But then we're looking critically to think about why this is bad, why we shouldn't do it, and how we can stop it. This is another text that you might have seen. Uh, it was in the news a few years ago. Lots of people talked about it, that eating chocolate may help you to win the Nobel Prize, okay? And this text was in many, many magazines. This, I think, was one was CNN News, and sorry, CBS, and one was in Time Magazine. Because a professor, he did a table which showed that the more, the countries that consume more chocolate are also the countries that have more Nobel Prizes. Now, of course, again, if we're going to go deeper into this text, which many people didn't, and this is the reason for thinking more deeply, many people just read this, they saw the headline and believed that it was all true. Um, and in this case, what we get is the students to think critically about, well, is there a real connection? Is there a connection, direct connection between chocolate and Nobel Prizes? You know, if I go out and eat more chocolate tomorrow, will I will I suddenly have a chance of winning a Nobel Prize? And of course, the text explains in the end that, in fact, um, of course, the simple question is that the countries that can afford to eat more chocolate can usually afford more money for scientific research, for uh, investigation. So, of course, the connection is not between chocolate and the Nobel Prize, that the connection is between money, uh, affluence, and the Nobel Prize. So, let's make sure our students don't just stay on the superficial level of texts, let's get them to go deeper. Another connection here is this idea of texts changing our minds. Reading is such an important thing in our lives because I'm sure if you would um, think about the books that you've read, to what extent have they changed you? To what extent have they influenced you and your opinions? And I think we need to encourage this idea of letting texts maybe change the way that we see things. This is a, uh, it's a thinking routine and it comes from um, the Harvard uh, uh, Graduate School of Education, Project Zero. It's called 321 Bridge. So the idea of thinking of three words, for example, connected with a topic. So my topic was using smartphones at school. So you might want to do that in the chat box, okay? What three words come to your mind when you think about using a smartphone at school? So um, you might be putting all sorts of ideas that it's, uh, I don't know, laziness, uh, technology, connectivity. The students write down three words. 
Then they write down two questions that they have about this topic, in this case, using a smartphone at school. So your questions might be, are smartphones um, allowed at schools in the UK or the US? Uh, or, um, you know, do, do students have to leave their schools, uh, sorry, leave their mobile phones when they arrive at school? So they think of three words connected to the topic. They think, they think of two questions connected to the topic. And then they think of one simile, okay? And um, then what happens is um, the students uh, share their ideas. And then what they do is they read the text. So this is a text, for example. It could be a text about anything. So as I said before, these are not limited to one text. All of these ideas you can use with any text you like. But the idea is um, that the students... They think about these words, these questions, this simile, comparing smartphones with something else. They read the text and then they decide, have they changed any of the words? Would they change the questions that they've got? Can they find the answers to their questions? And um, have they changed their idea about similes? So this works particularly well at higher levels, of course. Um, but it's the idea. The, it's called three, two, one bridge because they think of three, two, one. Then they read the text. The text is the bridge to see if they change any opinions. And um, a little bit connected, if you like, with that is this idea of using texts to see things from different points of view. Now, um, again, when we read fiction, one of the reasons that people give for reading fiction is that it can put you in somebody else's mind. And that's a really powerful thing to do, particularly as you're growing up. Here, the idea, you remember that I had my text for the 911 for emergencies, and I told you that there are different ways of looking at this question. It could be funny or less funny. Here, the idea is an activity called circle of viewpoints. And what you do, and again, this you can use with any text that has got strong characters with different sort of um, opinions there. What you do is you get your students into groups of three. So one of you is a police officer working at the 911 call center. One of you is a person who has just made a hoax 911 call because you were bored and wanted to make your friends laugh. And one of you is a person who has just tried to call 911 to report an accident. Um, but the line was busy. In other words, we've got three completely different viewpoints on the same event. OK, so the same event, but three different ways of looking at it. But looking at it. Think about how you feel and why. Make preparations. So you're giving the students thinking time. And then you have a little role play conversation. And this is a really great way to get inside a text. So you're really getting the students to um, feel as if they're part of the text. By the way, this is a great activity when students read graded readers, get them to take on the parts of the characters in the story. And um, we're really encouraging empathy and deeper thinking. And um, finally, my, well, next to last, my next to last point, um, I think this is a great way of getting to grips with slippery issues. In other words, I think with critical thinking and crit critical reading, we have to bear in mind that sometimes there are no black and white answers. Life is very complex, and I think critical thinking is a great way to get our students to realize that life can be complex. Not everything is black and white. This was a tragic story that happened some years ago again. Um, there was a terrorist um, attack in, I think it was San Diego. Uh, let's see if I can see. San, I'm not sure where it happened. I, I think it was San Diego or San Francisco, maybe I can't remember. Um, but, oh, right, I'm stupid. San Bernardino. <laughs> Sorry, my mind is going. Um, terrorist attack, and um, they killed the terrorist, but they had his iPhone. And uh, you probably know that iPhones are uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to lock. And the, um, the CIA tried to get uh, Apple to open the, um, the terrorist's phone. Now, this is a really complex issue, isn't it? 
you know, what should happen in this situation? Should Apple um, un unlock uh, phones? Because that is also in some ways an invasion of privacy. On the other hand, of course, we've got a terrible attack. And by opening the uh, iPhone, we might be able to save other lives. So what we've got are questions that are not so black and white. We've got questions that are opening students up to the idea that, as I put here, number one, critical thinking and reading doesn't always lead to clear black and white answers. And in grammar, um, English teachers, we like black and white answers. It's either correct or incorrect. Um, but just to remind you, of course, that with critical thinking and critical reading, there isn't always a clear black and white answer. Another thing I think to bear in mind is that your answer your answer is maybe not always the right answer. Critical thinking is about people questioning and looking at things from different points of view. And I think we have to be careful that we don't simply give the answer ourselves as we are always right. And thirdly, maybe some of you are thinking, well, okay, it's good to do this critical thinking, but they won't do it or they won't do it seriously. We have the expression in English, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So we can teach our students about critical thinking, but we can't force them to do it. That is very true, but I like this quotation by Tony Little, who was the headmaster of Eton School. Schools give young people a place at the water's edge. A horse may not choose to drink if it is led to water, but it cannot drink at all if the water is not there. In other words, I believe we have to teach critical thinking. If our students sometimes do it a lot or do it very little, that's not really the question. We have to explain how and why it's important, encourage our students, and at least we're giving them a chance to think more deeply. And I think that's why, again, in Gateway to Success, we've got, again, these pretty important topics. A, uh, Agenda 2030, which, by the way, I, I think you might be interested to know that in Italy, you are well ahead of Spain in your dealing with Agenda 2030 in schools. It's only just beginning now in Spanish schools that people are looking at the whole of this question. Uh, and I think in Italy, you were very quick to embrace the whole topic of, um, you know, sustainability, of equality, and many of these issues, which I believe, you know, they really are important for t t today's teenagers to look at. My last point, uh, my last critical reading skill is visual literacy, which I think is also a skill that students need to think about. Um, we saw those pyramids before and are they real or are they not real? This is an idea here where we show our students an image and we uh, get them to look at it, describe what they can see, describe what they think it shows, and then wonder uh, about the whole topic. Uh, in the chat box, does anybody know what this photo is? Is graffiti a good thing or a bad thing? So there's two questions at the same time, actually, is what do you think you can see there and what do you feel about it? Any ideas? Okay. Okay. I'm just going to check. This actually, this photo is, um, you might know this photo, of course, it is from Italy. Um, and usually we would say, you know, don't encourage graffiti, of course, but this says, please write on the walls. And um, I'm sure that some of you, some of you might even live in this place, right? Because this is from Verona, right? Where um, the wall is covered with graffiti because of the famous balcony, right? With um, Juliet and Romeo. By the way, I've been there. I even have a photograph of me kissing my wife there, but I thought I wouldn't show you that just because, you know, little bit private there. Um, but it's an interesting text. So in other words, when we show an image, let's forget text sometimes. Let's just look at the image, get our students to react to the image and say what they think they can see. And of course, the problems with images is that they can be uh, hoax images like this one. Uh, I thought I'd just finished my talk with some funny images for you here. Can you see that? That looks like um, a very funny uh, building because it says Olage of Architecture and Planning. It's in fact fake, okay? So it's just Photoshop. Here's another one. This is a great photo. Have you ever seen this photo before? Of course, that looks like the real thing. It looks pretty amazing. And of course, 
it's a another example of Photoshop, fake photos. Here's another one. That's a great photo, isn't it? If that was true, that would be pretty cool. But in fact, of course, we've just superimposed the cyclist with the bear. That's a beautiful place in the world. I would love to go there and visit, but of course it's not true. It's a collage of two photos. And finally, this photo, I'm sure there's somebody from Venice, hopefully following us today. Um, it looks like Venice in the Ice Age, and of course, it's not quite true either. So we're going, and uh, actually fake images and uh, deep fakes, as they're called now, of like creating fake videos, I think will be the next problem that all of our students have, knowing whether they can believe what they see with their own eyes. There are no fake images here. These were from different trips to uh, wonderful places in Italy. Hopefully I can get back to you one day. Um, uh, maybe you're from one of these places. I think we've got Naples there, Vicenza, if I remember rightly, and uh, Milan. I, I don't know if there's anybody from Vicenza out there today. Um, do uh, You can see the Gateway Facebook page address there. If you've got any questions, I think, uh, Cassie and me, we're going to have time maybe for just a few questions. And if not, you can always <coughs> contact me there at the uh, Macmillan Gateway Facebook page. Okay, thanks. Um, so we do have time for a few questions if anyone feels like adding uh, any questions to the chat box. Uh, in the meantime, there were a few questions that come through. Um, one of which was about uh, the three, two, one bridge uh, activity, which I really liked. Um, have you found that useful? Well, of course you have, but how do your students react to it? Yeah, I mean, I think usually when people um, look at the three, two, one, I mean, the three words is very easy. The two questions is very easy and very useful. Um, I think people usually worry about the simile uh, because you need a little bit of imagination to come up with a simile. Uh, in my yeah. experience, as long as you've done the three words and the two questions, you'll be fine. I would also say that when I do this in class, I'm often surprised by the similes. That I think we think that students don't have ideas. Uh, one of my students, for example, said using a smartphone in school is like using a pen. And, you know, that's like a very interesting comment, isn't it? Because it's yeah. like, saying, well, you know, for that teenager, it's as simple as, it's a simple instrument, right? So, you know, yeah. even that one simile leads to lots of, um, you know, great debate, really, you know? So, you know, again, should you or shouldn't you use it in class? So, um, yeah, I try it. You know, sometimes with the activities that seem a little bit more unusual with a simile, we're a bit afraid, but give it a go. And if they don't come up with similes, they will come up with words and, and um, questions, definitely. Okay, and a question from Valentina about that um, activity was, do you allow students to use like a, a dictionary uh, in those activities or? I have no problem with students if they want to use a dictionary, yeah. I mean, I would imagine them to sort of try and use what they've got. But I mean, if you want to give them, you know, if they're coming up with things that they haven't got the words to express, give them the chance to do that, yeah. Yeah, after all, they are, I mean, the whole point is to help them, uh, you know, learn vocab and, and other uh, other things. So I don't see a problem uh, with yeah. using the, um, the dictionary. It was funny, one of the things uh, that you showed us, um, you know, the fact that classes can now uh, connect with other classes uh, across the world. Uh, I remembered when you were explaining that uh, when I was a young student many years ago, uh, we had a sort of pen pal uh, exchange program with, with students in other parts of the country. But I don't think it would have the same effect. I don't think it had the same effect as it would today with video. I think video is um, really uh, bringing those uh, distances um, you know, is minimizing those distances. Yeah, I mean, um, one of the things that I've written recently was about, you know, um, like the food that teenagers eat and do you think it's the same all over the world? And, you know, that that's an interesting question, isn't it? You know, do, I don't know. I mean, you know, Italy, for example, I mean, I'm just thinking of Italy. Obviously, I, I don't know it as well as I know Spain. But I mean, you know, fast food, is it, you know, it, are teenagers fast food obsessed? I know in Italy in general, you've got slow food and all the rest. But, you know, teenagers, do they go for, you know, for fast food or, or not? And, you know, what might explain those differences? So, you know, I think there's so much, um, it's actually interesting for me. I visited 28 countries and I've, I've you know, 
speaking to teachers and teenagers are often very similar in very different countries, you know, just because it's that stage of life. So, you know, I think all of those things about, as I said before, uh, that quotation that I read out, I think that's really interesting. You know, it, different is good, right? Different is, is great. The thing about differences is, is, you know, that it's respecting the difference and not just like, oh, they're weird, you know, they're weird because they do this. Well, no, they're different. And, and maybe they do that for, for a very good reason. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Um, you know, I'm seeing if, uh, if you'll excuse me, just having a look here and seeing if there's any other questions. It doesn't really I seem to be. Somebody mentioned Nazareno, I think it was, was mentioning touching Juliet's chest or something, but I didn't do that. So apparently there's no divorce, no question <laughs> for me there. That's good. I also <laughs> saw that is out there from Vicenza, which is nice to know. I, I loved my time in Vicenza. Um, also, somebody asked if there is a gateway to success B2, and yes, there is. Um, yeah, there is. We didn't um, we didn't put the image on there. I'm afraid. However, there's an A2, there's a B1, there's a B2, and there's also an A2 B1 um, single volume. It's called, uh, it's the fast track, yeah. So, all right. Um, I think yeah, that uh, yeah. that should about wrap it up. Rep I'd like to say one final thing to everybody. Um, that the again, just just to repeat because I saw some people come on um, a bit later. The attestati will be available tomorrow um, on mondadorieducation.it slash attestati. So, Dave, thanks a lot. Always a pleasure. And uh, hopefully next time, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to do this uh, in person. Definitely, in yeah. Always, yeah. That, that's always the plan, right? But uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Plans these days, no, they never seem to work quite right. No, but uh, yeah, one day I hope that I get back to Italy. Uh, yeah, it's very close to my heart. Uh, thanks for all the nice comments here and thank you for thanking me. I uh, thank you again for taking the time to join. I know that everybody's really busy, but um, yeah. I really appreciate it. And as I, I didn't always have a chance to um, to look at the chat box, if anybody does want to contact me, feel free to contact me at, um, face, at the Gateway, uh, Macmillan Gateway Facebook page. Okay, cool. All right, thanks everybody. And I'll see you uh, in two weeks um, when we'll have uh, our next English Wednesday session. So take care, have a great evening and thanks again, Dave. Ciao, bye-bye, see you. Ciao. <laughs>